Good afternoon, everyone. So when we started Tableau Foundation in 2014, with the mission that you see on the screen behind us, we did a lot of listening. And one thing that we actually learned really quickly was that even though big data was being talked about in the media for decades, and even though funders were demanding their NGO grantees collect more data, and even though governments were making data more open, no one really knew what to do with it. No one that we talked to. And so what we decided to do in our grant making is we decided to start making grants on projects where we thought there was a chance that data could be used in a new and informative way so that people could see that and get inspired about how they could use data themselves to solve world problems that they were trying to solve. So the problem with data is that our experience of data is this. Rows and columns of data monotonously spilling off the skirt sides of our computer screens. But something magic happens when you turn data into information. Those rows of data turned into this visualization, and now they're starting to tell a story. In this case, about a condition that more than a million women a year are afflicted with. It's a perfectly treatable condition. And yet, what the data tell us on this visualization is that we actually don't know how prevalent it is. In the map in the upper right, we have an idea of maybe where some of it, where it's heavier prevalence in some countries. But what really tells the story is if you look at the little black dot, the black dot says where the world thinks the prevalence rate is for fistula. But those, those orange balls at the end of the line tell us what the high and the low estimates are. So the greater the variance means we really don't know what's going on in those countries, and the tighter it gets, we feel like we have a better idea. So it was their ability to take data and turn it into a story that encouraged us to invest in Operation Fistula and support their use of data to hopefully eradicate that condition for women around the world. But you know, there are other parts of data that are actually really important that we learned in our work. Take fighting infectious disease, for example, which we've been doing since 2014. Zambia is actually using data visualizations to keep track of the disease so that they can get in front of it and stop it in their attempt to eradicate malaria there by 2021. It's being used from the top of the Ministry of Health all the way down to rural clinics, like the Chicken Cotta Clinic, where I was about a month ago. And it's where I met some really awesome data people. I remember walking into the director's office and noticing that precariously positioned projector <laughs> aimed at the wall and watching as the director did a demo of live visualizations that they used to actually track the disease. She went on to explain that one thing that they've done is they've actually disaggregated the data. So they used to report the data at the district and the province level. But today, they actually collect and report data at the clinic and the community level, because as they get closer to elimination, they need better precision in terms of being able to understand how and when and where they need to allocate their scarce resources. And when an ember of infection flares up in a clinic or a community, they can go stamp it out become, before it becomes a raging wildfire of infection that's harder to stop. She also told us that they used to have data meetings every June to talk about the data and decide how they needed to make program adjustments. Well, today they have data meetings every Thursday. Because if you want to stop an infectious disease and you want to use data, the information about the disease has to travel faster than the disease itself. And lastly, she told us that uh, they use the data in every clinic, they've been having the benefit of being data-informed now for more than four years, and they have not had a malaria death in the Chicken Cotta District since 2014. We also learned something else very important, and that is that if you want people to use the data, the people using the visualizations must be involved in building them. Data is about people. It's about informing people so people can use, use that information to make better decisions. So the days of a government or an NGO creating some system 
and dropping it into a developing country and demanding people use it need to be over. The communities who are collecting the data, who are making the decisions, need to be involved in actually building the visualizations they use, and if they build it, they will come. In fact, not just they will come, but others will come. So in Zambia, they were so successful with their visualizations that their colleagues in Senegal saw what was happening and the outcomes they were achieving, and they asked if they could try them too. So instead of Senegal having to start from the bottom up and build up to where Zambia was, Senegal was able to take the Zambian visualizations and modify them for their own use. And they not only modified them, but they actually used their own human intelligence and ingenuity to add their own creative solutions and ideas into the visualizations. And now what's happening is all the great work that Senegal did that built on top of Zambia is flowing back into Zambia. And so we hope that as we invest in building data literacy and capacity on the ground in those countries, that a data community is forming. And it's not one that was forced upon them by funders. It was a data community that's formed by the community, for the community, because the community is getting benefit from it. Now, real-time data isn't just limited to infectious disease. Imagine having a job of having to allocate resources globally to try to improve food security conditions for some of the 800 million people a year who suffer food insecurity. Well, our friends at World Food Program are doing that. Traditionally, they would send staff out with clipboards and paper, and they would collect data, and then they would bring it back and analyze it and print it into a PDF 30 to 60, 90 days later. Today, what they're doing is they're using an innovative mobile technology to collect food security data from some places like the Boko Haram territories of Nigeria and elsewhere, and they're able to produce these interactive visualizations in three to four days. Imagine being the program director for Nigeria and having up-to-date information about food security conditions so you know what resources and interventions are going to work the best. But we also learned something interesting on this project. So you see up at the top, there's those blue boxes with words that are kind of stringed together. So the program directors in Nigeria and other countries were used to seeing their PDF. And God forbid somebody changed their PDF. <laughs> so what World Food Program did is they actually designed their visualization to follow the same flow as the PDF starting with key points, methodologies, and so on. And so what they did is they developed the, used the technology to develop a solution for human beings, is they considered the human beings in the equation. And they built a tool that now allowed those human beings who were stuck on their PDF to be able to actually have an easier transition to this new use of technology. But we always tell people, Real-time data is not always necessary or worth the cost. That's the case when you're actually fighting emergencies. Imagine being one of those people in the Philippines who has to respond to typhoons. I know one of them, and he told me one time, he said, we in the Philippines eat typhoons for breakfast. <laughs> and imagine the different types of housing and roofs and sanitation systems on some of the 7,107 islands of the Philippines, and having to plan for and respond to disaster. Imagine how difficult that must be. Well, UN OCHA developed a really great dashboard where you can click on any one of the islands and you can see how many people are there, what the gender mix is, how many schools, and even down to the roof, toilet, and water system types. So with this information at the fingertips, now when typhoons are heading toward the, toward the islands, they can actually look and plan and decide which types of supplies and resources they need to send to those islands to help people come start restoring the island back to its glory. So my last example. Our friends at the One Campaign are known globally for having this amazingly beautiful, and sexy brand that makes a difference. So what they taught us is that when you're trying to change the hearts and minds of people, in this case, educating people on where in the world it's hard for girls to get an education, they showed us that you can make data beautiful 
and elegant, and dare I say, sexy. And if you go to this visualization on their website, you'll see that you can explore the data. It's a, it's a long page where you can explore the data and actually educate yourself. But there's also something just visually gratifying about how they put this together. So these are just five examples. How data tells a story. How data can be used in real time to stay ahead of a disease or to better inform decisions around uh, food security. And how this isn't at all about technology. In fact, it's not even about data. At the end of the day, this whole story is about people. People using data and people being influenced by data. So while people still continue to struggle with knowing what's possible with data and good, what good looks like, we continue invest, to invest. And so I hope that in just seeing a few of these examples, you can see more in the tech lab, that some of you leave inspired with ideas for how you could possibly use data to advance uh, work that you care about. And more importantly, I hope like my friend, Mr. Litia Mwamba, Mwanga, you too can find the joy in data. Thank you. <laughs>